special military operation, and the Russian political regime. In this piece we would like to set the record straight on our view of the special military operation and the conflict in Ukraine. As we see it, all the misunderstanding and conspiracism that has been flourishing in the leftist info field around the reasons for the start of SMO follows from an inadequate assessment of the specifics of the Russian economy and Russian political regime. Already here, on shore, it is worth to set a disclaimer. The word regime or political regime will be written here in a neutral sense only. Without trying to give the term a negative or positive connotation by applying it as a synonym for political system in general, we encourage readers to perceive the word in that context in this article as well. Dissonance of Understanding, Economics Even before the operation, there were fairly adequate assessments of the contemporary Russian economy in the leftist info field. Thus economist Oleg Komolov, in a number of his videos and interviews, describes the following, oil and gas exports are the most profitable, and consequently the key sector of the state economy. As a result, other economic spheres and areas are either secondary, or adapted, tuned to the oil and gas economy. Thus, Oleg describes a situation in which currency exchange rates are artificially inflated to increase the profit from the pipe when recalculated from currency into rubles at the same time, negatively affecting the rest of the economy. Hence follows the Dutch disease of the economy, its semi-peripheral status and not only economic but also political dependence, at least partial, on importing countries. We can also add here the historical political context. It is no secret that the most stable and well-fed years for the Russian ruling class were the noughties. Komolov notes that at that time oil and gas gave Russia an enormous profit, which, however, was not spent on the development and modernization of other sectors of the economy. Which is not surprising, because the biggest profit for the capitalist in our market was in oil and gas production. And with all the losses for society as a whole, the capital, naturally, tended exactly there. Dissonance in understanding, politics. We will probably discuss the reasons for such a systemic rupture in leftist attitudes later. For now, what matters for us is the concrete break in logic. Komolov's assumptions, which are correct and have become dominant, do not draw any conclusions at all. The economic determinant of the basis, it seems, is in no way connected and in none relation to the superstructure. So while an abstract conclusion that a relatively consolidated political system also follows from a single, dominant sphere in the economy is rarely drawn. Naturally, in the perennial attempt to understand the irremovability of power in the liberal sense of irremovability. Then, for example, the fact that the political regime, as a weapon of the bourgeoisie, follows its own real economic interests, is not understood at all. And the regime gravitates, suddenly, towards stability and uninterrupted operation of the pipe. Do you still remember also the dominant industry and the semi-peripheral status? Such a status, in itself, dictates political attempts to preserve the stability of markets, including political stability. The predilection for well-fed, pre-crisis noughties and stability has already become a meme, nevertheless it is a characteristic of the economic and political interests of the Russian ruling class. Before analyzing the current situation, let us try to analyze the politics before the war, the politics that led to the war. Straight from Lenin's precepts. Politics before the war. Strange as it may seem, West Russia relations in the noughties could be characterized as friendly. The pipe is working steadily, the crisis has not happened yet, and Russia has ideas about Europe from Lisbon to Vladivostok, among other things. The economic crisis of 2008 started the story. The undeniable drop in profits from the main industry created political instability, which led, among other things, to the Bolotnaya. Nevertheless, what matters to us is Russia's attitude to the second Maidan in fascizing Ukraine. We have already covered the Maidan itself and the intra-Ukrainian specifics of the political and military confrontation here. Briefly, it is worth noting the following theses. In response to the outburst of chauvinism in western Ukraine, a movement began in the south and east, in Novorossiya. It began in the entire territory from Kharkov to Odessa. The Russian ruling class, meanwhile, decided to return Crimea. The reasons were primarily of a military strategic nature. The emergence of a chauvinist, pro-Western regime posed a threat to military bases in Crimea and to influence in the potential Black Sea theater. There was no imperialist character to the capture of Crimea due to the lack of even the prospect of profit, 
That said, the interests of the Novorossiya movement and those of the ruling class in Russia aligned in Crimea. The Crimeans wanted to return to their country, and the regime, or state, wanted to secure a strategically important point on the map. But the interests of the Russian political regime and the Novorossiya movement did not coincide anywhere else except in Crimea. Thus, there was no reaction from the regime to the mass killings in Odessa on the 2nd of May and in Mariupol on the 9th of May. There was also no reaction to the defeat of the Russian spring in Kharkiv. Moreover, there is an interesting and important case related to Kharkiv that reveals the situation of that hot year. Local oligarchs Dobkin and Kearns, back at the dawn of the Maidan, supported the anti-Maidan movement that had gained spontaneous popularity in Kharkiv. But at some point, they both go to Moscow. Hoping, after the Crimean example, to get guarantees and hope for cooperation with an entry of Russian troops. Sources say the answer was, no. No one was going to enter Kharkiv, and on their return, Dobka and Jeeper abruptly changed their rhetoric from anti-Maidan to, we are for a united Ukraine. Dobkin and Kern's trip to Moscow, against the backdrop of the Russian spring in Kharkiv. As a result, they allow right sector gangs and special forces into the city. The masses who have taken the local state administration are dispersed and the state administration itself stormed, while criminal communities have carried out purges and harassment of local residents. The storming of Kharkiv also elicits no reaction from Moscow. With Donbass, the scheme Ukrainian nationalists are quick to destroy local resistance and we, from Moscow, pretend it did not happen, did not get a pass. The Don base, by that time, had managed to start forming an armed militia, and the street gangs of the criminal communities who had entered the city were driven out by a mass participation of people in the streets. There are conspiracy theories that Strelkov, with his group of 70 men, himself started this war on orders from the FSB. That does not square with reality at all. Firstly, the first clashes with serious militia forces took place not only in Sloviansk, but also in Lysychansk Severodonetsk. In the former it was Strelkov's group with a huge number of locals attached to it. In the second it was Moskovoy, with his ghost group. Further on, there were no active battles yet, but detachments were already being formed in Donetsk, Luhansk, Orlivka, Markeevka and many smaller towns in Donbass. They formed in isolation from one another and spontaneously. Unfortunately it will not work to attribute everything to Strelkov alone. Moreover, it is a well-known story that Strelkov was constantly waiting for Russia to join the fighting and complained that this was not happening. Ironically, Medvedchuk's leaked talks tell us that even then, in April-March 2014, the Russian political regime was trying to reduce the confrontation to negotiations. It was establishing contacts through Medvedchuk with the Ukrainian regime, while trying to find influence groups willing to negotiate within the militias. The interests of that pipe made their presence known. May Crimea was too important strategically to lose. At the same time, southern and eastern Ukraine, Donbass, was completely unnecessary and unprofitable for the Russian ruling class. Attempts to pacify the parties in April and May were unsuccessful. The war began to gain momentum and influence groups were simply not in a position to influence the militia in the face of Makhnovshina and a governmentless situation. The Ukrainian National Security Forces, similarly. Next, the following step takes place. The Donbass decides to hold a referendum on joining Russia, in the manner of the Crimean referendum. The initiative does not meet with support in Moscow, and Putin speaks out against it. The format of the referendum changes from accession to Russia to a declaration of independence, with an unfulfilled promise to hold a new referendum on accession to Russia. The Minsk epic follows. After the referendums, following the outbreak of war, representatives of Donbass, under close supervision from Russia, sign and attempt to implement a document that envisages a return to Ukraine. With a number of stages on elections, disarmament, transfer of the border, etc. In the fighting between the militia and the Ukrainian fighters, however, the North Wind has certainly played some role. A political situation has developed in which the movements have gained too much power to be drained by Moscow. But also too disadvantageous and dangerous for stability, if by helping them, to allow them to fight back and smash the enemy, the Ukrainian Nazis.
In this way, Moscow contributed to the defeat of Ukrainian forces in the southern cauldron, but immediately froze the situation and did not allow the success to be consolidated and exploited on the battlefield. Marupol was one of the milestones of this dual policy of draining impossible, just save. There are conspiracy rumors that after the defeat of the southern grouping of nationalists in Ilovaysk and in the border and southern cauldrons, Marupol as well as the entire southern frontal front collapsed. The city was abandoned by Ukrainian forces and could have been taken unhindered by Donbass forces. The conspiracy is that a certain oligarch, Akhmetov, allegedly made an agreement with Moscow in order to protect his property in Marupol. The now infamous factories in the news. Well, that move in 2014 had cost that bloody and difficult storming of the city in 2022. Next was the recognition of Petro Poroshenko and the non-recognition of Donbass's legitimacy. Local battles for the airport and Debalt Sevo. Disgraceful, unilateral implementation of Minsk, when the Ukrainian side practiced artillery attacks on Donbass, while the Donetsk people kept SAU and other artillery systems sealed off. Unilaterally, they went to the withdrawal of troops, which was used by the Ukrainian side to seize separation of forces zones. In general, both Donbass and Moscow were living in the logic of the ORDLO, separate areas of Donetsk and Lugansk regions, not the DNR and LNR. When they were trying with every effort to push reintegration through Minsk. But there was one problem here until the very last. The Ukrainian regime, in its nationalist frenzy, did not and could not agree to any compromises and agreements. We have been talking about this for a long time. Carthage must be destroyed. The Ukrainian regime, in its current form, is untenable and the only scenario for resolving the situation is, by force. And, guided by the logic of the pipe, and the stability of the gas and oil sales markets, the Russian regime tried to hush up and sweep the situation under the carpet. Despite the fact that war was inevitable. On the whole, summarizing the logic of the Russian regime's policy on Donbass, it was an attempt to hush up the situation with minimal losses. On the one hand, the regime could not allow the direct military destruction of Donbass by Ukrainian Nazis. This move would have precipitated a political crisis for the regime. The logic of the next contour of the military-political confrontation intervenes here, as Ukraine has become a military tool and puppet of Western imperialist regimes. On this, further on. On the other hand, a full-fledged entry into Donbass would mean a threat to the pipe, sanctions and instability of gas and oil markets. In this respect, the logic of the politics of the eight post-maiden years has been locked into these two aspects. The option of resolving the situation was found in between these factors. Thus, Minsk envisaged no military defeat for Donbass, while at the same time reintegrating it into Ukraine with no risks of sanctions, war or threats to the oil and gas sector. But the logic of the Ukrainian regime's development made war inevitable. For eight years the implementation of Minsk has not started. On the contrary, those eight years were spent on military construction, on establishment of new type of fascist regime, on establishment of total propaganda control, and in broad sense on pumping up of anti-Russian chauvinism. The logic of the pipe has come into contradiction with the logic of history. Whoever chose between war and disgrace got an even bigger war and will probably get an even bigger disgrace. The Outside Contour an aspect that cannot be omitted is the role of Western imperialism in the establishment and functioning of the Ukrainian regime. In essence, in an eight-year preparation for war, Ukraine has been trained by instructors from the US and NATO. America's notorious military conquest of Ukraine was well brought through outside NATO and a number of constitutional norms. Economically, Ukraine has lost any kind of subjectivity, becoming a peripheral market for Western countries. Further, of course, the chauvinistic tendencies in Ukraine were used by the US to fight Russia. For quite imperialist reasons. War looms on the horizon. On the eve of the operation, and specifically the year and a half or two years before it, was marked by periodic swings of the redeployment of forces to the borders. The scenario was similar. Ukraine begins another wave of transfer of equipment and forces to Donbass and the eastern part of the country as a whole. Russia announces another exercise and redeploys forces to the Ukrainian border, 
Indeed, the sequence in each case has been exactly that. The Russian regime moved forces and assets as a reaction to a similar move abroad. While the media portrayal looked mirrored, with both sides running trains with tanks, in fact the process was of a fundamentally different nature on different sides of the border. The Ukrainian side was transferring forces, leaving them in positions in the east of the country. It was building military infrastructure and preparing for both offensive and defensive actions. In fact, each redeployment was just another wave of concentration of forces. The Russian side was transferring forces and was actually conducting exercises, demonstrating strength and using the transfer as a political factor. The redeployments were intended to scare and warn the Ukrainian fighters against aggressive actions in Donbass. The fall in tension also meant a withdrawal of forces and assets from the Russian side. Yes, no infrastructure was being built, no preparations for action were being made, and the forces simply withdrew to their locations. The redeployments, in our opinion, had only the political objectives described above. The start of the war, but not of the operation. In fact, the war started in 2014. But its specificity was that it was structured into relatively calm positional phases, and hot phases. So, the hot phase of the war in Donbass began two or three weeks before the start of the military special operation. Two weeks before February 24, the Ukrainian side launched massive artillery strikes against Donbass, position battles and attempted assaults on the front line began, and DRGs, subversive reconnaissance groups, crossed the front line en masse to attack civilian and military infrastructure in order to create disruption and panic in the rear. Artillery strikes A series of explosions on the GTS, gas transportation system, Explosion of the car of the head of the DNR's corps, unsuccessful assassination attempt, attempt to decapitate the militia before the attack. Fighting with DRG in Gorlovka, LNR. DRG breakthrough on the southern front, breaking through to the Russian border. Drone attacks on oil storages in Donetsk. Positional battles in LNR, on the northern front of Donetsk. Active fighting and artillery fire forced the leadership of the republics to declare first mass evacuation and then mobilization of reservists. The war was in full swing. Special military operation. Beginning. As we can see, the war in Donbass had already begun. Just as another redeployment of the Russian armed forces had already begun to wind down and withdraw the troops to their deployment sites. And so, another attempt to scare the Ukrainian regime by redeploying troops to the border failed, the regime began its aggression in Donbass. But what now? Now it turns out that the deployed troops were not meant to be used for war in earnest. What has happened is that the political factor of deterrence has had to be thrown into the fray. At the same time, the political factor had neither the numbers nor the equipment for large-scale warfare. We remember the reduction in military activity near Kiev, also, an underestimation of the enemy's combat readiness played a role. In other words, long and behold, aggression began, and long and behold, the Russian regime, militarily, found itself with a naked. And long and behold, the Russian regime was not even facing a choice. The military aggression against the Republic started, it became obvious to everybody that the corpse of the Minsk agreements had already decayed. Zugzwang, there were no other options to resolve the situation. And so, Russia undertakes a strike with spreaded fingers. With those insufficient forces that were at hand, because there are no other options. From here on it is not history, but the harsh reality of a long and bloody war. And now let's get back to the regime in Russia and a few other issues. The imperialist aims of the war. Conspiracy and reality. Strangely, it is obvious to the modern, leftist, ideology of our internets that war can only be started from directly imperialist objectives. Compulsion, pulling into war, preventiveness of strike, response to aggression, are not considered as options. Nevertheless, although the thesis has become obvious and mainstream in the left-wing info field, no convincing and concrete proofs of the thesis have been found. There have been conspiracy stories from tankies and completely abstract theses from Krasnobayev. So far, as a fact, we can state that there is no convincing argumentation on the issue of economic and, more broadly, imperialist goals of the attack on Ukraine. 
apart from our oil and gas logic, of course, but that is for you to judge. So far, as we can see, the Russian oligarchs have consistently spoken out and spoken out against SMO. Interesting story, the main beneficiaries of imperialist aggression are against it. Further, the threat to oil and gas markets, threats to supplies to Russia and other facts of economic disruption caused by the sanctions were an obvious consequence of the war. Moreover, this damage to the economy would not depend on the outcome of the war. In fact, not even the potential economic targets for the start of the operation are visible. On the contrary, only potential as well as real economic damage is visible, even under the most optimistic scenarios of winning the war. There is also an argument that the visible costs may be outweighed by specific benefits to specific oligarchs. Forbes magazine says that it is the oligarchs, not the economy as a whole, that bear the costs. Meanwhile, the economic losses in almost all sectors of the economy, and of the oligarchs from almost all sectors of the economy, are compensated by small capital gains in the capitals of owners of domestic IT and electronics, who benefit from the isolation from the West. Did Elbrus lobby for war? No, some leftist conspiracy theory. We recommend reading this and this in detail. How the profits of the Russian oligarchs have changed. The thesis of losses for the economy but gains for individuals from the SMO is untenable, neither realistically nor potentially. Characterization of the regime in Russia. So, back to the beginning of the article. As we can see, the real characteristic of the regime is inert semi-peripheral sub-imperialism. The distinctive feature of responses to foreign policy challenges is inertness, reactivity to external challenges, with an absolute absence of its own policy and agenda. To summarize, if we abandon the fictitious fantasy world, with a restored Tsarism, just like in 1905-1914, we see that the regime's real distinctive feature is weakness. It was in the interests of the Russian Empire's regime to seize the Straits as a convenient outlet to new markets and to extend its influence into the Balkans. The Russian regime, on the other hand, does not put others under its control, but only finds ways to cooperate with neighboring countries. An example is Kazakhstan, where the role of Russian capital lies within interaction with established local groups of capitalists. Pro-Russian Transnistria has formed its own, local financial monopoly, with which Russian capital and regime does business. Belarusian industrial concerns are also largely autonomous. At its time the economy of Donbass was not taken under control either, but was placed under the control of the local oligarch Tsar, with whom Moscow did business. In general, the entire political economic strategy of the Russian regime over the past decades has looked like this. Capital flowing into the most profitable sector of the economy and neglecting other sectors. This is how Russian imperialism was expressed, not in competition and thorough occupation of neighboring markets, with subsequent political expansion, but in sluggish links and cooperation with local capitals, with a total lack of political expansion. The recent case of protests in Kazakhstan is illustrative. The episodic support for the Kazakh regime has had absolutely no impact and has not sparked pro-Russian trends in Kazakh power, capital or society at all. Chauvinist sentiments continue to grow there, the government continues to appoint Russophobes, stigmatizes the Soviet regime, distances itself from Russian imperialism and increases oppression of the Russian minority. Belarus, for example, was playing a multivector policy until to the last moment, when direct attacks from the West literally forced Batsyak to make a final choice in favor of Russia. The whole policy of the regime speaks of its reactivity, in terms of only reacting to external challenges, rather than pursuing its own strategy, and its inertia. At the same time, local PMC actions in Africa, which do not lead to political costs, or pipe interests in Syria, are defended quite zealously. And now, this weak link of imperialism, the sick man of Europe, is forced into a clash with the Western imperialist center. To declare war on its own markets. Really? The ideology of the Russian world. An ideological reflection of this state of the economy, government and society, has been the ideology of Russian world, which has had some popularity since 2014. Yes, it tries to show the regime as strong, defending its national interests and its people abroad. To make itself look like an empire, 
What's more, this ideology is also quite convenient for the modern leftist, Russian, LOM, leader of public opinion. Look, this is what we were talking about. But in reality, this ideology was a beautiful poster covering a hole in the wall. Breaking it down, it is an ideology of weakness, not expansion. To simplified, it reads as follows, Russians and pro-Russians abroad, hang in there, have a good mood, we are spiritually with you, feel unity with us and the Russian world, but we will not help you in any way. As a historical fact, we can state that this ideology did not emerge as a justification for the unity of the colony with the colonizer, like the ideology of the Greater East Asia Co-Prosperity Sphere. This ideology did not emerge as a beacon of democracy ideology that justified neo-colonialism and puppets their surrender of their own sovereignty in favor of the US. This ideology emerged in the context of Minsk as an ideology that tried to explain to the Donetsk people the inaction of Russia, that tried to explain to the oppressed non-citizens of the Baltic countries the inaction of Russia, that tried to explain to the Russians of Kazakhstan and Central Asia, who live and flee from local chauvinism, the inaction of Russia. In this respect, it is an ideology that tries to pass off as imperialism what is anti-imperialism. An ideology that does not exploit the national question for bourgeois purposes, but an ideology that extinguishes the national question for bourgeois purposes. But after all, many leftist LOMs find it more convenient to build this into their cosplay picture of the world where they are, Bolsheviks under Tsarism. Something ends, something begins. At the end of this article, I want to ask myself and readers, so what role does the Russian regime play in history? Progressive or reactionary? Klim Zukov, in his series of clips, History of the Revolution, offered the following conception of the development of Russian history. Low yield, the specificity of geography, resources and, consequently, of the basis, did not allow Russia to develop based on the domestic context of the country. Other examples of similar conditions not favorable for the development of civilization, are the conditions of civilizations of Mesoamerica, Africa, etc. But what has prevented us from naturally entering the internal equilibrium of stagnation are regular external challenges. External political factors that force the state to respond to them on a regular basis. To modernize the economy and the army, often artificially, from above, to seek access to the sea, etc. We will not go into detail, because they are in the videos. Let us only say that such spurts of modernization, revolutionary changes and reforms, describe the logic of the country's development from Ivan III to IV till Stalin. Indeed, the revolution of 1917 was the force that broke the stasis of Tsarism, which was slowing the progress of our country. The revolution unleashed the potential, and allowed us, through directed efforts, to force progress to cover in 10 years what it took others 50 to 100 years to do. In this context, what is the role of the contemporary regime? We shall characterize the SMO as a forced progression. After all, under the pressure of external circumstances, the regime finally deigned to begin solving the problem of Ukrainian Nazism, it deigned to confront Western imperialism. But on the other hand, it is the same regime that is quite gravitating towards stasis, towards inner equilibrium, when the pipe brings profit and nobody and nothing interferes with this. The very Dutch disease of the economy, a situation in which the strengthening of the country's currency negatively affects the economy because of increased supply in the commodities sector, pushes it to respond to challenges then, when no other options remain to maintain the oil and gas equilibrium. Overall, it appears that the regime is precisely reactionary but in a specific way. The Russian regime is trying to turn the country into a big banana republic, a gas station. And it is only external challenges, external powers trying to redivide the Soviet legacy, that are forcing the regime to resist. This same legacy gives it some residual capacity and resources to resist. Give us 50 years of calm and we will turn into a big banana republic. Moreover, it was precisely this passive stance that has led to the snowball of problems, which have led to the terrible situation we have today. Obviously, a full-scale invasion of Ukraine in 2014 would have ended up eliminating that bloody eight-year war with its current stage. It would have eliminated eight years of chauvinist propaganda in Ukraine and saved the masses of expelled, intimidated and murdered supporters of the Russian Spring throughout southern and eastern Ukraine. But the logic of the reactionary regime, pushed it to maintain equilibrium, stability by any means.
the regime's forced response to challenges and aggression does not fundamentally change the fact of its predilection for stability. And that's why our regime is bad, and that's why we oppose it. Where the left is caught up in a world of illusions and is talking about fascist Russia that attacked poor non-Nazi Ukraine, where the guards, conservatives, justify and deny all the problems that our regime has created, where the liberals have simply become the instruments in the information war of Western imperialism, we offer to look at things soberly. Get rid of illusions, stop making analogies and start working with your head. Where liberals, conservatives, right-wingers, and most of the left see a horrible authoritarianism that must be destroyed, we see weakness, tendencies towards stagnation and passive reactionarity. As a consequence, the right, the left and the guards alike offer us nothing but the preservation of another version of equilibrium, which will only lead to the degradation of Russia. In fact, opposing the regime, but not its reactionarity. We on the other hand propose progress. We propose, first and foremost, to fight reactivity, stagnation, and depression. Sorry, but the challenges and problems that Russia's passive policy has accumulated are already beginning to change into quality. And the logic of history requires from us either new breakthroughs, or stagnation and equilibrium until Russia dies. And unfortunately, just as the issue of Ukrainian Nazism must be resolved, so must a plenty of other issues. It is also clear that the current regime will postpone for tomorrow any issues, even minor ones, until they become major problems. It is also clear that the new reality with the escalating conflict between the major imperialists leaves us no chance of survival, other than to put Russia on the back burner again, and run again in 5 to 10 years, the same missed 30 years. It is even more obvious that in the face of sanctions and limited resources, the only way out for us is some form of planning. Stability ends, the struggle begins. No matter how much you want to duck, it's not our war, the sides are the same, chips will go down for you, too. The only thing is that many will probably never understand it. Delinking, Jush or Stalinism, call it what you like, find whatever historical analogies you like, but the path is charted.